Where could Charles be, Geraldine Liston was thinking. All through the house, the lamps were lit. The windows were open, too, and the doors were unlocked. It was January 1971, and Geraldine had not spoken to her husband for 12 days. She was on holiday in St. Louis and had tried to phone him a number of times, but no one had answered at the house. One night, she had a terrible dream. Sonny was falling in a shower and calling her name, Jerry, Jerry, help me, Jerry. Geraldine returned to Las Vegas and drove home with an eerie premonition. Copies of the Las Vegas Sun had been piling up in her driveway for over a week. She opens up the door, walks inside, and smells this terrible, foul odor. Sonny must have left something out in the kitchen and spoiled. She climbs the stairs to the master bedroom. The TV is on, and it's just snow. And she looks at the head of the bed and sees Sonny lying there with his feet over the end of the bed, and he's quite obviously dead. And I ran back down the step in order to leave to say, what's wrong? I said, son is dead. That was a horrible sight. His body was bloated, stiff, and stinking very badly. And that's how Sonny was discovered. Sonny Liston had not been right for a long time. Jobless and nearly broke, he had been moving through the murkier waters of the Las Vegas drug culture. He came to me, I never will forget it. He said, Jerry, let me have $500. $500? I said, hell, we got bills, what for? You know what I mean? And so he had this guy with him, and he was in his car like, Sonny, why you wanna, you know, be over with them bums, you know what I mean? So I told the guy, I said, I'm going to go get my gun, and you and Sonny better get. Sonny lived in the most schizophrenic town in America, Las Vegas, which one end has the strip, and the other hand, at one time, had the most churches of any city in America. He had two lives. He had the lives with his friends, in which he lived a relatively civilized and ordered life with his wife, and then he had the other life where he'd jump on pianos and he'd dance at night and he would, uh, you know, he'd get very drunk on vodka. As the end of 1970 neared, Liston had reached that final twist in the chord. Honey, Liston! Eight years earlier, he was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Perhaps no other prize fighter had ever brought to the ring so palpable an aura of menace. Liston hammered out danger. He hammered out a warning. Woman, you better stop all that arguing over me. In public, he was often hostile, surly, and uncommunicative. And so he fed one of the most disconcerting of white stereotypes. That of the ignorant, angry, morally reckless black roaming loose with bad intentions in white society. In the papers, Liston was referred to as a gorilla, a latter-day caveman, and a jungle beast. And the NAACP was horrified that Sonny was actually going to fight for the heavyweight champion of the championship of the world. They wanted a, a good Catholic kid like Floyd Patterson representing the black community. They didn't want this baleful black felon. His fights against Patterson were seen as morality plays. Patterson was good, Liston was evil. Before the referee could count to ten in that first fight, Liston had become a mural-sized American myth, a larger-than-life John Henry, two hammers, and an 84-inch reach, 23 knockouts, and 19 arrests. He thought winning the title 
would give him the pedestal that would raise him above his old reputation. Sonny Liston boarded a flight from Chicago to Philadelphia. He settled into his seat next to his friend Jack McKinney, an amateur fighter who was then a sports writer for the Philadelphia Daily News. This was the day Liston had been waiting for ever since he first laced on his boxing gloves. Sonny practiced the speech he was going to give and the crowds greeted him at the airport. McKinney told me years later, he said it was the turning moment in Sonny Liston's life. He knew what he was going to say. He was going to represent all black people. He was going to go to churches. He was going to see kids in the street and tell them to stay off drugs. He was going to be the people's champion. As the plane rolled to a stop, he rose and walked to the door. McKinney was next to him. There was no one there except for airline workers, a few reporters and photographers, and a handful of PR men. His eyes swept the whole scene. He was extremely intelligent, and he understood immediately what it meant. You could feel the deflation, see the look of hurt in his eyes. He had been deliberately snubbed. And he realized then he would never rise above his reputation as the bad guy. The central tragedy of Sonny Liston's life is that he never had a sense of identity. He never knew when he was born. He never had a sense of place in life. All he knew is he had this dark past and that he was always trying to free himself from it. I think he died the day he was born, said Harold Conrad, a Liston publicist. By the nearest reckoning, that birth would have been in a tenant shack 17 miles northeast of Forest City, Arkansas. He was the 24th of 25 children fathered by Toby Liston. He worked in the cotton fields. There was little schooling, and he couldn't read or write. Liston said, we grew up with few clothes, no shoes, little to eat. My father worked me hard and whooped me hard. When he was 13 years old, his mother left home and went to St. Louis to get a job. And Sonny was tired of getting beat up by his father all the time, and so he left and went up to St. Louis looking for his mother. Sonny very soon graduated from ruling his neighborhood by force to armed robbery. He wasn't very old when he ended up in prison. Good one morning. Even though the blue come forward down. He learned how to fight in prison. Father Eloish Stevenson first strapped the gloves on him. He had 14-inch fists that Father Stevenson said it was hard to fit gloves, conventional boxing gloves, onto his hand. He had to cut them a little bit to get them on. In 1952, Liston was released on parole. He was a mob fighter right out of prison. He had many run-ins with the St. Louis police. The police knew he had been in prison and would always stop him and search him. So he went through alleys all the time. On one occasion, an officer creased Liston's skull with a nightstick. And two weeks later, the fighter returned the favor by depositing the fellow head first in a trash can. After bludgeoning Patterson in yet another first-round knockout, Liston took nobody seriously, and this would lead to a colossal misjudgment. When he fought Cassius Clay, he didn't train at all. Don't you have any respect for him at all, as a fighter? As a fighter? I think he should be locked up for impersonating a fighter. Johnny Robo has a hurt. On the night Geraldine found his body, Liston had been dead for at least six days. And an autopsy revealed traces of morphine and codeine 
of the type produced by the breakdown of heroin. Officially, he died of lung congestion and heart failure, but circumstantial evidence suggested that he died of a heroin overdose. There were fresh needle marks on one of his arms. Some police officials, and not a few old friends, think that Liston may have been murdered. Though they have no way of proving it now, so the speculation continues. He always used to say, if I get to be champ, we're going to go all over. And that's what we did, and you see, he buy me a cow like he was a loving person. But when all that's done, he was a weak man. He let people take advantage of him and wouldn't speak up. I'm the one that knew it, you know. I used to talk to him, try to get him to do strong. And that's the reason that uh, he's not here with me today. He is buried in Las Vegas, directly under the flight path of planes approaching McCarran International Airport. One of Liston's friends, a father Murphy, attended the funeral. They had the procession right down the strip, he said. People came out of the hotels to watch him pass. They stopped everything. They used him all his life. They were still using him on his way to the cemetery. There he was, another Las Vegas show. God help us. No one is really sure, and Liston was never sure, when actually he was born. And no one is really certain when or how he died. So his birth and his death in mystery form symbolic bookends in his life. And I find that to be the central tragic emptiness of Sonny Liston's life. In the end, it seemed fitting that Liston, after all those years, should finally play to a friendly crowd on the way to his own burial with a police escort, the most ironic touch of all. With Geraldine gone from Las Vegas, few visit Sonny's grave anymore. Every couple of minutes, a plane roars over. And every once in a while, someone comes by and asks to see where he's buried, says a cemetery worker but not many anymore, not often.